lot of the discussion quick on electronic submissions. Most of you, um, you're also in 4N and you've done um, your first electronic assignment submission. And uh, for most of you in 4N, that was quite okay. But there are a few of you in this class that are in my other class. So I just quickly want to talk about that. For some of you, this might be the first time you submit documents electronically. For this course, our preference for the TA and myself is that you do so. You are welcome to submit paper as well. If you feel um, if you feel that way, you fine. But uh, we do prefer electronic submissions. However, if you do submit electronically, there are a few things we need to talk about. The first way uh, that you submit electronically is if you do not email your document to us. You just simply share your documents. I'll show you how you do that in a minute. You share it with those two email addresses. So no emails, just you share it online in Google Drive. Uh, the documents that you share must have that uh, structure. That's just so that we can keep track of the various documents coming uh, our way. If you choose to do your submission in, in Word, uh, save your document as a PDF file. Do not email Word documents to me. Um, I have a version of Word on my computer, but it, will, it, it doesn't show equations and it messes up the document when you email it to So I cannot deal with Word documents nor can you see it. So PDF is the only way we can actually view the document properly. If you do decide to use Google Docs uh, to submit to your, your assignments, there's this short video here on the course website that shows how to do so. Um, you can insert equations, graphs, uh, text, tables, all the regular features of Microsoft Word are available online in Google Drive. So um, I'm not going to demo them all, but if you go to Google Drive um, on, your, on your Mac account, you click Create, and you create a document. You get your blank document over here, and you can add text, and there's bold, underline, and so forth that you need. There's tables that you can add, you can insert equations over here, you can insert figures hyperlinks, page numbers, all the rest of the formatting that you're comfortable with uh, on, um, in Microsoft Word, you can do online. The advantage of Google Drive is uh, mainly for the fact that when you're collaborating with your other team members. So I recognize that many of you um, work asynchronously. In other words, you don't uh, work together face-to-face -face in the library. One person might be at home, another person elsewhere. And Google Drive allows you to edit your documents simultaneously. So uh, for multiple uh, people in a group, that works really well. Um, you don't have to email documents back and forth to track your versioning. So Google Drive takes care of all the versioning over here. You can always see your revision history, who made which changes at what time. Um, and so that helps you keep track of that. Let's say you're, you're, you've done your assignments and then you're ready to share it. You go, uh, well, first you just rename the documents to that uh, naming format I asked you for. Uh, so 4 and 3-2013, etc. And then uh, share that document with the TA and myself. So share and just enter the TA's email address and my email address there into that invitation field. So, uh, and make sure that you leave it there with editing permissions. That allows the TA and myself to, um, to comment on the document. And, and do the grading electronically as well. Okay. Any questions? Yeah. If we write like, stuff by hand and then scan it and put it as a PDF, is that okay? Or would you rather we type everything up? I, if you write by hand, scan it, take a photo of okay. it, and include it in your document, that's quite okay as long as the clarity is good. Yeah. Um, I've had, had those sort of submissions where it's very hard to read. Uh, so please make sure the clarity is really good. But I'm quite okay with figures being scanned. Um, if you're sharing your PDF document from Google Drive, you upload it into Google Drive and you share it in the same way. Um, so don't uh, email those to us. Okay. So let's, uh, let's go back to the example we were looking at in yesterday's class. So just to recap, we, were, um, we had shown several videos in yesterday's class on hidden settling. We had shown videos on flocculation. And the key point from yesterday's material is that from a theoretical perspective, we cannot predict the rate at which particles settle. So 
There was a question as well related to that is what's uh, the difference between terminal settling velocity and this interface heights velocity? Well, they're, they're not the same things. We're, in our cases, consider, considering a stagnant fluid. So the fluid around my particle or particles is stagnant. There's no velocity. So the, the velocity at which this particle settles is the velocity we're dealing with here in this question. In hindered settling, or when you've got a high concentration of particles, that velocity is the velocity with which the interface between the solids in a high concentration over here and the supernatant liquid above it. So it's the supernatant, the clearer liquid above it. We're inter interested in that interface and how fast that interface settles. Now recognize that this supernatant liquid is mostly free of solids, but there's no guarantee. There's very often cloudy supernatants that we will see, especially when you have very, very fine particles in suspension. Uh, those very fine particles will almost never settle because they're, they're kept in suspension, they're by Brownian motion. So we will almost never see a totally clear supernatant. One way to actually try and clarify that supernatant as best we can is by adding flocculant. And the flocculant creates larger particle size or agglomerates that then will settle out. So we can clarify our supernatant by the use of flocculants to get those really, really small particle sizes out. So that was what the MIT video um, was showing yesterday. It was on wastewater treatment. We want to get those viruses and bacteria, very small particle size in the, in the single digit micrometers um, and double digit micrometer particle size, get those out of the suspension. If you calculate the terminal settling velocity for something that's in the order of 10, 20 micrometers with very low density, you'll see that the settling velocity is like millimeters per, per day. It's like almost will never, never settle out. So, so that's why we need flocculants. So let's go uh, back to the problem we were dealing with. Um, we were trying to design a sedimentation vessel that's going to operate on a continuous basis by using batch data. So here we've got a batch system. And what we're interested in is that, that velocity at which that interface drops. We're going to take that result then and design this continuous process. This continuous process we call operates where we've got our feed coming in, our flocculant is combined and it's well mixed, and then it's, it's put into the center of the sedimentation vessel. So when material feeds in there, it's dispersed, and we try to do that in a way that will minimize disruption to the existing settling that's taking place. That those solids then settle out along the base. And our assumption is that those solids are distributed across that area. Though in practice, there will obviously be some non-uniformity of that. We cannot get all our solids evenly distributed. But what we do know for sure is that in this cross-sectional area indicated here with the red dashed line, that all our solids will pass through that interface and then ultimately leave through the underflow. Our assumption is that our overflow here contains zero solids, which is pretty reasonable and acceptable assumption. Yeah. Well, that's what that in like practice for that that will be mixed the solid either. No, we'll we'll show um, in a minute how slowly that rate rotates. It's it's a very, very slow rotational speed. And all that the rake does is it actually opens channels in the solid to allow the liquid that, and air that's trapped in there to, to leave and actually pass out. Okay. So recognize what's happening in settling. In settling, we've got our solids moving down. Something has to give and go up to take that place. Okay. So the liquid that's being displaced by the solid needs a way to go up again. And so the rake creates channels to allow that liquid to, to leave and go up again. Yeah. Um, is it kind of saying that like anything below the rate is not moving? Because I'm just thinking that if this thing's turning around, is it not mixing up all the sediments again? It's moving at such a slow rotational speed. It's like a few rotations an hour, less than that even in many situations. So uh, I've got some some numbers for that. It's a, it's not it's not uh, resuspending the solids at all. Yeah. So there's there's various rake designs as well that will help uh, counteract that. 
So when we had these equations up here yesterday, and we've spoken of the flux that passes through that imaginary line. So flux then is the mass flow of solids per unit time, so kilograms of solids per second per unit area. So I, I just wanted to spend a little bit more on that derivation there. So do you mind just uh, use this formula that psi is equal to C naught times V? Let's take a look at actually where that comes from in a minute. Uh, so I've added this um, here just to help you visualize it. So we've got that cross-sectional area and my solids passing through that region. So my flux by definition see this over and over in engineering systems, flow of a various of a various types. So energy flux, mass flux. In this case, that's what we're looking at is the flow of mass per unit area. And if we look at the flow of the solids, what is that mass flow? Well that's easy one to get. It's equal to Q times C0. Okay, divided by the area A. So Q times C0, Q is my volumetric flow rate coming in, you just cube the feet per minute, coming in at the center of that, that vessel. So Q would be the flow rate coming in the center point over here. So that's the combined flocculant and feed flow rate in uh, meters cubed per unit time. C0 then is the concentration of the solids in that feed. So we can take a sample of that and calculate the mass of solids per meter cube. Two very easy to obtain numbers, two numbers that we'll always have available to us when we design the system. So that's going to give you my flow of mass, because I'm assuming all my mass will pass through that uh, hypothetical cross-sectional area. Now, let's look back in our fluid flow course. If I take flow in a pipe or in any, um, any cross-sectional area, I've got a flow rate Q of cross-sectional area A. The velocity of that is Q over A. So meters cubed per unit time divided by area. So if we just do a unit balance here, meters cubed per second divided by meters squared, I'm going to get velocity units in meters per second. So that velocity V is Q over A, so if I sub in that over here, I can get V C0 or C0 V, which is what we use in the slide. So don't just, uh, just use the formula, understand actually that where that simplification comes from. <coughs> so that's over here in this um, slide yesterday, we had this stated over here, that that flux is the concentration of solids multiplied by the velocity, but the derivation is actually is another step or two. Now, when we design these units, we're interested, obviously, in that cross-sectional area. That's our, our end goal here. So yesterday, we had this slide up. So area is QC naught over psi. That's a simple rearrangement of this formula over here. So the area is Q, which I know, C naught, which I know, divided by twice, which I don't know. But I can substitute in that relationship for flux, that psi is equal to the velocity times C naught, and then I get that simplification that the area is Q divided by the velocity of the set of velocity. And so then we went on to this problem yesterday, and we had um, we didn't really actually solve it numerically, we simply had time in the class to simply plan our approach and to define what we know and what we don't know. So we, we knew the volumetric flow rate, Q, is 2,100 liters per minute, or 2.1 liters cubed per minute. And then we need to find that velocity D. That was uh, where we had ended off the class, where as we said, if we recognized in our plan, we're going to use this formula over here. We know Q that's given to us. We just weren't 100% sure what V is, and what did we mean, by the way, when we said over design by a factor of two based on that set of rates for that velocity V. So here's the, um, here's the solution to it. Let's take a look at velocity V is easily found from the, from the lab experiment. So that's our goal here. <coughs> So 
So draw a picture always if you're if you're unclear what's uh, going on. We've got a, a graduated cylinder, 300 millimeters tall. So it's my cylinder in the lab with the various graduations on it. And we notice that if we put this, this sample in it, it drops from 500 millimeters down to 215 millimeters in a period of four minutes. But that's not giving me a, a settling velocity. That's simply showing me the volume on the cylinder changing in a four minute period. Making the assumption, and we've seen in the video and we've seen in our previous slides, that, and it's a reasonable assumption, that that velocity is constant over that, that period of time. So that velocity would stay the same within that four minute period. It's not going to change. We can make a good assumption then to calculate that settling velocity height. So the way we can do that is to say, well, if we went from 500 millimeters down to 215 millimeters, that's a change of 285 millimeters in a 500 millimeter container. So the fractional change is 285 over 500 multiplied by the original height of 300 millimeters. meant that I dropped 171 millimeters in a four minute period. Okay, so from that I can get my settling velocity of 42.8 millimeters per minute. Making that key assumption that it's constant velocity during that four minute period. So to get to we just need. So he has a cylinder that's filled with material. I shake it up and I let it settle. It takes four minutes for the interface height to go from 500 millimeters to 215 millimeters. So that, that amount, it's settled by 285 millimeters was the change. 285 millimeters out of the 500 millimeter total, that's the fraction of the height of the cylinder used. My total cylinder height is 300 millimeters. So I can calculate the settling height change in four minutes is 171 millimeters. It's a standard uh, approach to measuring um, these velocities. So I could either plot that curve and, and measure the slope over time, or I could simply just start and end it and then calculate the average velocity over the four minute period. So second velocity then, 42.8 millimeters per minute. Now we're asked to over design by a factor of two based on that second velocity. Should we halve that or double it? Well, the answer's up there. <laughs> yeah. We should halve it. I think you had mentioned that yesterday as well. So it, we should halve the velocity, right? If we, uh, we're we saying then that it settles slower than what it actually settles at. So we're going to over-design the unit to accommodate for lower settling velocities. Slower second possible, say. So take that 42.8 millimeters per minute, halve it, and then use that as my velocity instead. So instead of using the true velocity of 42, use a, a velocity of about 21 or something. Okay? And then if I take that uh, velocity, that modified velocity, and substitute it in the formula, the cross sectional area is Q over V. So use this uh, Q is our given flow rate, and then we call this VOD for over design velocity. It's um, half, half the original velocity. That gets me 98 meters squared of area required. And I add an additional seven to it to account for the center of the basin, which has that uh, settling region. So we, we spoke a bit about this yesterday. Let's just recap that. There's my sedimentation vessel viewed from the top. Um, it has a certain diameter d, which I'm trying to calculate. This area of settling, 
I've just computed 98 meters squared is this shaded region. I add an additional 7 meters squared to accommodate for that inner setting region. So that's, that's quite common. Our rake goes through there, the drive shaft for the rake. Um, various access points to, uh, to the unit go through that central area. And it's also a part that just allows the turbulence to settle a bit. So there's often a weir around here to isolate the feed from the rest of the sedimentation vessel to prevent the turbulent feed coming in and disturbing the rest of the segment. Okay, so that takes up 7 meters squared, so we have to add that onto our area to get my total area required. And then from that, I can go calculate the diameter of the vessel. Yes. Explain again why you have the cylinder. Why I have it? Okay, sure. So the true setting velocity is 42 millimeters per minute. Okay, so that's whatever rate that is. Now, if I go ahead and design my unit based on that settling velocity, I'm going to get a certain area. But what we're saying is that let's assume that I'm doing this experiment in the lab. What if that sample isn't quite representative? Uh, or a year from now, we're trying to treat a feed that's modified a little bit different from what, we're, what we have right now in the lab. So to accommodate this uncertainty in the future that I have on my feed, and maybe even experimental error and, and so forth, let me halve the velocity. Okay, so assume that the velocity is actually slower than what I think it is. By doing so, I'm going to design a unit that's larger than I would otherwise need and will accommodate that uncertainty. Okay, I don't double my velocity. If I double my velocity, I'm, I'm going in the opposite direction. I'm going to make the unit smaller than I really need it. And it's not going to perform as, as required. But by doubling, doubling the velocity, uh, halving the velocity, I'm going to double the area, as you can see in that formula. So my area is going to be twice, twice the size than actually required. Okay. So, any other questions on, on that? Let's take a look at the second part of the question. It says if the feed coming in is at 1.2 kilograms per meter cubed, what is the loading rate? Yeah. Sorry, real question. Yeah. Um, even though it ends up being the same thing, is there anything wrong with buying the area and then doubling the area? Or no, like the there's nothing area? wrong with doing that. Okay. Yeah. Nothing wrong. Yeah, because in this formula, the relationship between velocity and area has that uh, relationship, that inverse relationship. So as long as you recognize, but let's say I said I uh, use three times or one third with velocity, then you need to triple the area. So just yeah. work with the system. Yeah. Okay, so let's go back to part two, the loading rate. Uh, what is the loading rate? Find that. Someone else? <laughs> Someone from the back? Loading rate equals Kevin. Great. I don't know. C0P. Okay, so loading rate <coughs> is the same as flux. It's just another word for flux. The C0P. Calculate that 1.2 kilograms per meter cubed of feed. Now, by the way, that's a very high loading rate. So, municipal waste in North America, that's very, very high. Consider, uh, for, a, for a loading rate of solids. Uh, most municipal feeds are in the order of 0.8. But in big cities, um, that a number of 1.2 is almost an overestimate. And we have to work with that because we have to accommodate the worst case situation coming to our process. So we don't design for average conditions, we design for worst case or close to worst case. So we're going a little bit higher than we would normally need we're not going to see 1.2 kilograms coming down into the, into the treatment process uh, regularly, and these processes certainly don't operate at steady state, so um, we will be getting varying feeds. 1.2 is at the high end. So what's the loading rate? C0 times V, that gets me a value of 74 kilograms per day per meter squared, and that's how uh, these are typically quoted at, in those units. Mass per day, oh, sorry, kilograms per day per meter squared, and uh, Perry's is always a good source to go to for design of these units. Any separator, Perry's is an excellent text because it gives you typical values. Okay, so you can quickly see if you're out of, out of spec or not. 
So if we were drastically out of that range, we would have to question our calculations or justify why we are. So in this case, that works. That works. Okay. Any concerns? Okay, so let's take a look then at some other um, sedimentation vessels here. The, when we design this, we, have, we may have doubts on how big they should be, how, how wide and what depth. How long should the particles remain in the vessel? This is sort of the residence time. So if we look at Perry's, we can see that sedimentation vessels are usually rectangular or circular. And you would, there's, a, there's advantages and disadvantages to either one. Uh, rectangular units, you will feed in at one end and the material flows and is taken off at the other end. Okay, so there's, there's, it's quite easy to partition it in zones. So your effluent, your clear liquid and solid is taken off at the other end from the feeding. The main concern that you want with any sedimentation vessel, circular or rectangular, is that you have no short circuiting. You don't want the ability for your solids to be able to leave in your clear overflow. That's the main criteria when we're designing that, is to look at the flow patterns. Um, because usually our concern from a sedimentation vessel is what we're desiring is that clear overflow liquid. The solids are often not of interest. It's the clear supernatant that's of interest. So we don't want solids contaminating that stream, so no short circuits. Okay. So we, we've spoken a bit about this uh, yesterday and today. We want even distribution and minimal disruption to our fluids. Uh, we don't want to create currents, either through our rake or um, through our way that we feed the material in. So here's a... Here's a conceptual diagram of the rectangular settling vessel. We have our inlet zone, and then our solids come in through that pipe Q, and they're assumed to distribute through that inlet zone and start settling. And they'll settle down with that velocity V that we've calculated from our lab experiments. But there's also a horizontal velocity. Both fluid has to flow from left to right, so there's a, there's a definite uh, horizontal velocity. And so the sum of those two velocities gets me an angular direction coming down. And our aim is that, that those particles reach the sludge zone, the solids reach the sludge zone before they reach the outlet. Okay. So any solids that have not touched the sludge zone are assumed to then leave out in the overflow. I haven't drawn it here, but it's, uh, it's implicit then that there would be a, a, a mechanism to remove those solids off the bottom and, and let that process operate continuously. Okay, so you have to balance this quite carefully. That unit has to be long enough so that the particles spend the necessary time in the vessel so that they actually do reach the bottom. If you increase that flow rate Q, those Horizontal, that horizontal velocity component is going to be too large and the particles will actually just end up leaving out in the, in the overflow. Okay. Okay. So the design criteria, in other words, the residence time needs to be just right. So we're going to look at that um, in this diagram and, and I'm going to give you a minute or two. Convince the person next to you that this is true. <coughs> and if I double that tank depth, that particle is still going to settle at exactly the same distance across here. So whether I have a deep tank or a narrower tank, doesn't matter. So in other words, the depth of the vessel has no effect on where that particle will ultimately settle. For the same flow rate Q coming in in both tanks, convince the person next to you that that's true. <laughs> And even better is you can prove it to the person. Yeah, that's good. 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 Yeah, that's good.
that cross-sectional area is twice the cross-sectional area over here. That implies the velocity in the top diagram, the velocity in the horizontal direction, is double the horizontal velocity in this direction, on this, in the second time. Okay. So material at the top is the horizontal velocity. I said that wrong around. The horizontal velocity in the top vessel is half okay. the horizontal velocity in the, the bottom one. Okay. So because this material is flowing at a slower rate in the horizontal direction, it will still settle out at exactly the same point in time as this one. Everyone convinced? Yeah? Okay, so that's going to be in the assignment. Now if we look at a circular sedimentation vessel, we have our material flowing in at the center and radiating outwards. So my solids and my liquid coming in that inlet zone. Here's my sludge zone at the bottom. Now these are normally at an angle so that we can efficiently collect our sludge. But let's, uh, let's just take a look at this hypothetical case. What happens is the velocity in the vertical direction is whatever the settling velocity is. In the horizontal direction, though, that velocity component changes depending on where you are in the vessel. Okay. So your cross-sectional radius, so there's my vessel, there's my entry point, those cross-sectional areas get progressively larger and larger as you're going from the center to the periphery. So that velocity in the horizontal direction changes depending on where you are along this distance. So the horizontal velocity gets slower and slower and slower as you go along towards the periphery. And so your fluid particles take this arc shape. Yeah. How would the inlet pipe portion get incorporated so that the water would, like the, the, the field shoes flying out of that? That would be one design. So there's, a, there's, there's, there's many alternatives. Uh, what we're looking at here is sort of like an idealization of it. Uh, so the assumption is that all my solids come in the middle and they sort of radiate out right. like that. But most designs, uh, the feed is at the top in right. the middle and then still follows those mm -hmm. same. So, like, so people go all the way to the bottom? Like no, that, yeah. So velocity in a horizontal direction changes with location. The vertical velocity downwards is the same no matter where you are because that velocity is only affected due to the gravitational force, okay, which is constant as you as the particle moves through. So again, here the key key requirement is to design that unit so that those particles have sufficient residence time to reach the sludge zone. So it needs to be long enough for the particle to make it to the sludge zone 
before it reaches the outside edge. Otherwise, it's going to be taken out in the uh, supernatant or the overflow. Okay, is that uh, mostly clear from the people? So, what is a typical residence time in a sedimentation vessel? of hours, is it hours, days, order of magnitude, yeah. I would be highly kind of what you're separating the size of particle and what industry. Yeah, definitely dependent on particle size. Absolutely. So the in the sugar video, anyone recall what the sedimentation time was in those vessels? So they had said in two hours the particles spent in those vessels. And that's a, that's a typical figure for a residence time. But obviously, if you're dealing with very finely uh, distributed, uh, fine particle sizes or small particle sizes, you say that's you're going to need a longer time to accommodate for that. But uh, two hours is a reasonable um, residence time. Some other rules of thumb um, are as follows. Recognize that our feed flow Q and the feed solids concentration C0, so they're, they're always known when we're designing these vessels. And one of the key conditions that we're designing for is to calculate, in many cases, the solids percentage in the underflow. Okay, so the solids leaving in the underflow, we're assuming, remember, all the solids leaving in the underflow, but those solids are going to be diluted with some amount of fluid. That percentage of solids to fluid leaving in the underflow is, is of importance to us. So if we look back at our uh, uh, hypothetical diagram here, here's my flow rate Q that I know, C0 that I know, but leaving out here at the bottom is some, so it's all my solids, but there's also liquid. And it's the percent solids in that stream that's, that's important. It's important because we have to be able to actually remove those solids. Right? It's not 100% solid leaving it. It's got to be liquid in there so that we can actually pump this out as a slurry. And then the type of, sorry, the percentage solids that's there is going to affect the, our choice of pump, whether we use a centrifugal pump or a diaphragm pump. So for high solids concentrations, we'll use a diaphragm pump. For low solids concentrations, we can uh, get away with centrifugal pumps. So we, that, that is an important criteria as well, is what's the nature of that material leaving out there. Another important criteria is uh, the surface overflow rate, so the volume per day per meter squared. And so those are typical figures for a primary vessel and a secondary vessel. Um, would be those sort of volumetric flow rates. So 40 meters cubed for a, a for a large primary unit and then 12 meters cubed per day per meter squared cross-sectional area for a second unit. So again, just good rules of thumb. Another rule of thumb is that sedimentation vessels are usually around three meters in depth. But um, again, that's, um, that's obviously there's many, many variations on that, but that's a good, a good starting point. If you're designing your vessel, remember so far our only design criteria has been the area. We've not said anything about the depth. So we've designed for this cross-sectional area. The depth of that vessel um, is also an important criteria because that's going to affect my residence time. Once A, the cross-sectional area is set, then I need to calculate D. I know what flow rate I'm feeding it at Q, and those numbers then will I can use to solve for my residence time, tau. So tau is equal to volume divided by Q. The volume of my vessel divided by Q is going to affect my residence time tau, and that, um, that needs to be a number that's typically in the order of two hours for most units, that's true. Some other rules of thumb, uh, minimum diameters for circular tanks are around six meters, and length to width ratios are five to one. Right, okay, yeah, so I've, I've presupposed uh, some terminology that you may not be familiar with. So primary units in a, in a flow sheet, 
this is exactly that. It's the first unit that get contacted, and then the secondary units are there just to clean up what the primary unit didn't catch. So we'll often we'll see that in, in wastewater treatment flow sheets, we'll see that in mining flow sheets, they'll, they'll call units primary units and secondary units. They have the same principle of operation, they'll be sized differently though, because the feed coming to the secondary unit is the overflow from the primary unit. So there's obviously much less solids coming to the prime secondary unit, so it doesn't need to be quite as large as the, as the, as the, to the secondary unit, so it doesn't need to be as large as the primary unit. Um, so two hour retention time, we sometimes will accommodate for longer times for lighter solids or in uh, winter times, uh, when viscosities are slightly different and, and densities <coughs> might change a little bit, but that uh, no, it doesn't modify things too much. Um, and then here, I mentioned this before, we need to design those sludge pumps to remove the solids. So very high concentration solids will require a different pumping mechanism. Okay, just some other things that we, we like to take into account when um, we're looking at separators is capital costs and operating costs. So this will, you'll see this a lot in some of the other courses in 4M. We'll look at this a bit more in depth, but I, I feel it's also important to, to recognize this um, from a separations course perspective, is what do these things cost us? So Perry's again is a good reference for that. Here's a, a correlation that they have that will uh, give you US dollars, I believe, I don't have it up there. Um, oh, sorry, Swarovski's textbook, I should say, not Perry's. In that textbook there, you can get the cost in US dollars as a function of tank diameter. <coughs> Um, and so it just shows there that as tank diameter gets larger, the cost goes larger, but it's not on a linear scale. It's actually on a scale with that exponent is 1.38. So it's, it's greater than linear, which would be expected. So a really large tanks are going to cost a whole lot more than, um, than a smaller tank. And it doesn't scale linearly. Uh, installation costs will be sometimes four times the actual equipment cost. If you look at, uh, there's, a, there's a good number of photos on Flickr and YouTube videos on how these units get built. You can see the labor intensity with building a sedimentation vessel is quite phenomenal. There's a lot of land that needs to be removed, unit built, rebar laid, and then the, the land uh, that was taken out has to be backfilled again. So all of that uh, takes up a lot of money too. Now, what's interesting from is an operating cost perspective is how little these units cost to operate. There's very, very low overheads on it. So very little electrical costs for that rake. Uh, that rake moves extremely slowly, 90 meters per minute um, on the peripheral tip. There's a very low power consumption, 12 kilowatts is no, there's almost no electricity to run these things. Very low operator costs, there's not, not a lot of it's done there, um, but the huge quantity of money is spent on the flock loads. So in this case, the chemical cost, the, the mass separating agent that gets added, is what's costing So that's true for many cases. When we have an MSA, that's almost always going to be the main cost, is that separating agent. In this case, there's no electrical, or almost no electrical cost. So the flocculant here is added as a mass separating agent. Our energy separating agent here is gravity, if we get that one for free. Now, here's something to consider, is I'd like you to go and look up some of these terms here, so for example, lamella and deep cone thickness. Take a look at what some of those units look like. There's uh, some modifications that get made to the standard design to accommodate for that. And then here's, um, Here's something I want you to consider as we start to go into the work for next week. We've designed our units for certain particles settling at, at, a, at a velocity. Let's take into account that our feed coming in doesn't have the same particle size distribution. Okay, so um, if we were to design a settler based on a single particle settling velocity for a given diameter, we're going to get one, one size. Or one area. 
But recognize that our particles have a variety of particle sizes. Some of them are going to be really small and some of them are going to be really large particle sizes. We're having a distribution. Okay, so we're going to look at how we quantify these distributions next week and how we measure this particle size distribution. But then recognize that our system needs to work for the entire range of particle sizes that we expect. So it needs to work for the smallest of particles as well as the largest particles up here. Okay, so this is really not where we're interested in. Because we know that if our small particles settle, our larger particles are going to settle faster than those. So when we design these units, we're interested in designing for down here, for the smallest of the sizes. So just, uh, we'll, we'll study these graphs next week and what this means, what this y-axis percentage means, what the horizontal axis is intuitive as micrometers. And then, uh, just before we finish up, I'll post uh, this question on the course website. I don't think it's in the notes. I'll put this on the, on the course website under the practice section and leave that for you. There's the answers for it. But I, uh, part one is easy. We've done that in our previous example. But question part two and three are quite different. So I'll give those a go.